welcome you here and uh, delighted to see all of you and um, appreciate you coming. And I want to really thank my dean, Dr. Priscilla Danheiser, who is the dean of the Penfield College, our adult program. I appreciate her coming. I appreciate her, period, you know, very much so. And for many, many, many reasons do I appreciate her with my experience at Mercer. And our Criminal Justice Honor Society uh, is also helping sponsor this. So uh, I want to mention a couple of things up front. When we finish uh, tonight, I'm, I've got some contact information if any of you want to talk about law school, I would rather sit down and talk to young people who are going to law school than almost as much as I'd like to go to Sanford Stadium on Saturday in the fall. Not quite, but I love, I love talking to kids about going to law school. So I've got some little information up here when we leave tonight. But I, I wanted to also mention just very briefly one reason that I am extremely interested in this particular trial is because I was very blessed uh, to get to know Vincent Bugliosi really well. Um, yeah, come on to the middle, young lady, if you don't mind. Uh, really well. And uh, it was important to me to get to be friends with him. I don't know how important it was for him to be friends with me, but we became really good friends. And, of course, he prosecuted Charles Manson, and he wrote the, the book Helter Skelter. And I uh, was blessed beyond measure to try several hundred major crimes of violence myself, uh, which disqualified me from teaching in law school, you know. But I tried several hundred major crimes of violence, and but I never tried one like the Manson case. Those are once in a lifetime type of cases. And it's a really important part of our history, and it's so many interesting things about it. So that's where we are. That's where we're gonna start. It was so quiet on that Friday night, August the 8th, 1969. It was so quiet that one of the killers later said it was like you could hear the ice tinkling in the cocktail shakers down the canyon in the homes of Beverly Hills and Hollywood. Shortly after midnight, Friday night, August the 8th, then Saturday morning, August the 9th, 1969, Helter Skelter began. Now what I want to do, I want to go to the direct result of what happened that night and then go back to the beginning and bring you up through the whole story. But I think to put it in context, to start with, I, I think we just need an overview of the incredible carnage, the incredible murder, the incredible violence. The, the crime of a lifetime that went on on the ninth early morning Saturday and then 24 hours later at a, another location. Now, it was eerily quiet that night. It was a very hot night in August of 1969. But that silence that deafening quiet was shattered by 
screams and more screams and more screams and more screams of bloody murder. It was like the bowels of hell had been opened up and out came everything evil bad. Helter Skelter, Charles Manson's long planned mass murder had started. And it was starting that night at the home of Sharon Tate Polanski, a 24 year old budding young movie star who happened to be eight and a half months pregnant at the time this happened. Now, during the story tonight, and I, I'm going to tell it to you like a story, um, I will go into a lot of detail about all of the victims and then all of the individual defendants. But on the Friday night, Saturday morning, shortly after midnight, quite apropos that it was right after midnight, there were five people brutally murdered at the Sharon Tate home in Benedict Canyon, which rose above Beverly Hills and rose above Hollywood. That night, five people were there. Four of them were inside the home. One of them was outside trying to leave in a car unconnected with the other four. That's a long story and I'll tell you about that. The next night at a different location at the home of Leno and Rosemary LaBianca, they were the victims of the Manson family's lust for blood and for death and for murder. Now, just get this as an overall picture. One individual, he was put to death in a very clean, antiseptic, humane way because he was only shot four times. He was not cut. He was not stabbed. The four other victims, deceased at the home of Sharon Tate Polanski. And the two individuals at the LaBianca residence, Mr. and Ms. LaBianca, 24 hours later. Those six individuals, the Manson family of a bunch of crazed loons, starting with Charles Manson, stabbed those six victims 169 times. 169 times. Now, no, no, I, I, I can't take any questions because I won't be able to get through, my friend. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm sorry. I just can't stop. For, I'll never get through. Now, <clears throat> the state of California obviously the city of Los Angeles, the state of California, America was shocked by this. This was just unbelievable. One night, and of course Sharon Tate carried some fame, and there was at least one other uh, person there with her that, that was known well, at least in the Los Angeles area. And then the La Biancas, 169 stab wounds. The only thing that would have made it worse is if, if Charles Manson had managed to think of Texas chainsaw instruments, but it was knives that did it. Now how did this happen? How did this happen? And why did it happen? Let's go back and begin at the beginning, which is a good place. Charles Manson was brought up in a home by his mother. His father was nowhere to be seen or known. But Manson and his mother grew up in a home that would bring new meaning to being called a dysfunctional home, a dysfunctional family. 
the mother was in prison for this and that. And Manson, when he reached the age of 14, he began a life of crime. So over the next 18, 19 years, Manson <laughs> is, thank you, bud. Manson, over the next 18, 19 years, spent 14 to 15 of those years in prison. Violation of the Federal Man Act, violate, uh, committed armed robbery, burglary, anything you can think of. Charles Manson was in the middle of it. Charles Manson, to say that he was an unattractive individual would be like saying there's water in the ocean. Charles Manson looked like he had crawled out of a grease trap on any given day or that he had crawled out of a pigsty. He was a little short, real short little Hitler-like type person, classic Napoleonic syndrome. A little pipsqueak, a little pissant, that's all he was, just a little pissant, pipsqueak. But a Manson, despite his remarkable unattractiveness, had something about him that attracted the dregs of society toward him. Um, Dr. Danheiser's PhD is in psychology, right? So I'm sure she could help us try to maybe figure out Charles Manson because it is an amazing psychological profile. When Manson got out of prison the last time, he had become an incredibly bitter, hate-filled man. During his time in prison, he developed a hatred for the white establishment. He developed a hatred for those who had been successful. He had been nothing but unsuccessful. He was a loser. You better believe he was a loser. When he got out of prison the last time in 1967, Manson went to the epicenter of the hippie drug culture, Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. And Manson had already served some time, not served time, had already spent some time as a pimp uh, between prison stints. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. Now, <clears throat> when he got out of prison this last time and went to hate Ashbury, that's where he began to develop his skill at motivating people to follow him. Now, the girls, virtually every single one of them that followed him, had brought new meaning to living uh, the life of a prostitute. Just about everybody, all the girls that were attracted to him. But there was something about Manson there was something hypnotic, evil hypnosis, hip, evil, but something that drew people who had failed miserably in life. <clears throat> now, to make a long story short, and it is a long story, Manson developed such a following that they became a family. And they became known as the family, the Manson family. And they moved from the Haight-Ashbury area of San Francisco to the desert outside of Los Angeles to a place called Spawn's Ranch. And Spawn's Ranch uh, had an abandoned movie set on it. And there had been a bunch of Western movies that had been made on that movie set. <clears throat> now, when the family moved there, they actually moved uh, in a yellow bus from San Francisco all the way out there t into the desert. And they set up shop, if you will, there on Spawn's Ranch. And Mr. George Spawn was glad to let them uh, live on the land in exchange for the men in the family, and there were about six or seven men, uh, doing mechanics work on the, all the vehicles around the ranch and the farm. 
and the women doing uh, different duties around there to help out with the farm. And so uh, George Spahn, 83 years old, was glad to let them reside there. Now, Spahn didn't have any idea the level of the degeneracy that was there. He just knew that this guy Manson looked like, as I said, he indeed had crawled out of a grease trap. That he was the father, he was the head, and they had all of these that appear to be the dregs of society. 16, 17 girls, six, seven, eight boys. Manson amazingly developed such a control over these people that throughout the trial, Vincent Bugliosi prosecuting the case would continually refer to the other defendants as Manson's robots. Because they did not have a will of their own, seemingly. Manson could have told them to go to the Empire State Building and go up to the 100th floor and jump off and they would have never even thought of not doing it. Now, <clears throat> Manson his control was, was so real that when people joined the family, they were told all of this about Charlie, Charlie Manson. He is absolutely perfect. He's a deity. And when they joined the family, they all had to have sex with Manson first, all the girls, that is. And then they were subjected to, not subjected to, because all of them delighted in participating in orgies virtually every night. Now Manson being a discriminating man of culture, a man of great culture, would only allow men and women and women and women to engage. He wasn't going to have any part of two men engaging. So they did all of the uh, sexual acrobatics there every night at the ranch. The children of the different members of the family would be separated when the family members came to the ranch or came to the family to live. Children would be separated from their parents. Manson brought new meaning to Jim Jones or David Koresh's ability to control. Now, <clears throat> In that regard, most of the members of the family were convinced he was Jesus Christ incarnate. They were convinced that he was an otherworldly figure. They used the term the infinite to refer to him, the reflection to refer to him. They called him man son and son of man. Manson uh, was glad to be deemed uh, the second coming of Christ or the re-coming re of Christ, whatever. Now, no one ever questioned Charlie. No one ever asked why. He, people did what they were told to do. The, the members of the family the members of the family, don't be distracted. The members of the family loved him, they worshipped him, they feared him, they obeyed him. That's what they all said. They would sit around the girls and be mesmerized when he combed his hair. Just sit there mesmerized when he's combing his hair. You know, kind of like uh, Ashley Judd watching Kentucky play foot, uh, basketball. That, that went over a lot of people's head. But. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Manson would always say, I'm as evil as I am good, and I am as good as I am evil. His family, the family members feared his reach. They said he had a reach for them. They feared his hold over them. They knew he could read their minds, but they loved him, they worshipped him, they obeyed him, they feared him. A member of the family was willing to be crucified to show his 
adoration and allegiance to Manson. So they, were, they got this cross and they were going to crucify him. And then when Manson saw, he was really going to do it. Manson said, no, he's, he's shown his love for me. Now, in the family, there was a definite pecking order. The top lieutenants in the Manson family were mainly women. Now you want to talk about some mean, Elvis used to sing a song, Mean Women Blues or something. And these were some mean women. They had been through the ringer in life. And they, of course, all of them, their brains were fried from drugs. Their brains were fried from drugs. Now the, the pecking order, though, at the top, Charles Tex Watson was Charles Manson's right-hand man. He was the executive officer, like Manson was the general, the commanding officer. And then in the next realm right there with Tex Watson was a girl, Susan Atkins, also known as Sadie, Patricia Krenwinkel, also known as Katie, Leslie Van Houten, she was just known as Leslie, and that was the real pecking order. Those three girls, Charles Manson at the top, Tex Watson, Charles Tex Watson, these three girls. Now, <clears throat> at the farm there, or at the ranch, there, was, there were two words that were continually spoken and continually understood to be the most important two words in the world to Charles Manson, helter skelter. The Beatles had uh, recorded an album late in 1968. It was called the White Album. I never did understand but what that meant, but this song, Helter Skelter, uh, captivated Charles Manson. And uh, he became obsessed with his idea of what Helter Skelter was going to be. And everybody always talked about it. Now the family, except for Tex and Sadie and Katie and Leslie, didn't really know what Manson meant by it much except he always talked about it. Now what Manson meant by that, there were three motives for Manson becoming the the murderer of a, the century. One was Manson was obsessed with, totally obsessed with blood and killing and murder. He couldn't get enough of it. And they had killed some people prior to the Tate Labayanka murders. They had, but they never could prove it, but they had definitely killed. In fact, someone named Hinman, and was his last name, was killed several days before the Manson, uh, before the Tate murders and the LaBianca murders. The members of the family there would go out night by night by night and do what they call creepy crawly exercises. Creepy crawly. Now Manson was quite an imaginative fellow, you know. A Renaissance man, he thought, you know. Now, <clears throat> the creepy crawly uh, exercises would be vandalizing neighbors' houses, stealing, uh, burglarizing, just creating all kind of hell. Pardon, just hell. And also, they did kill some people. But they were Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, Charles Tex Watson, Leslie Van Houten knew that they were in training for the weekend of Helter Skelter that was yet to come. Now, there were three motives in Manson's mind that were tied to Helter Skelter. The third one is so bizarre and so incredibly crazy, I'm going to just kind of deal with that fairly quickly in a minute. But the first two were very real, very overwhelmingly controlling Charles Manson's very existence. One, as I said, his lust for blood and gore and murder. The other was his 
obsession with getting even with the white establishment who had always mistreated him. He had never been accepted. He wanted to be a great musician. And in fact, he had lived in the same home with Brian Wilson, the lead singer for the Beach Boys, until Wilson had to throw him out because, you know, I guess Wilson was afraid he'd get rabies or something with Manson in the home with him. And, uh, <clears throat> but Manson fancied himself as a, going to be a great musician one day. And that brings me to the next part of the story because indeed this next part of the story shows that all of this was not a series of coincidences. On March the 23rd, 1969, eight days after we got married, which is an important day in history, of course. March the 23rd, 1969, Charles Manson and, Chuck and uh, Tex Watson went to Sharon Tate's home, Cielo Drive, at the end of a cul-de-sac on top of Benedict Canyon. Sharon Tate was married to Roman Polanski, um, a degenerate if there ever was one. You know, he brought new meaning to being a degenerate. He actually had a sexual encounter with a 13-year-old girl and whatever. Now, they, uh, <clears throat> but Polanski was always overseas making some movie in a foreign land, and Sharon Tate was there and she was four and a half months pregnant or so in March. Manson went there looking for a man named Terry Melcher, Doris Day's son. Now for you young folks, Doris Day is from another world. But she was a big time star when, when I, we were coming along. Uh, Great movie star, made a lot of movies with Rock Hudson and different people like that. Now, Manson drove up to the Tate residence. The people there at the residence that day were the same four people who were inside the home four and a half months later when Helter Skelter broke out that Friday night. Sharon Tate was there. Her ex-lover a man named Jay Sebring was there with Roman Polanski's permission, this being Hollywood, of course. And he was always there, but he and Sharon Tate were no longer engaged in sexual gymnastics at all. He was just the friend there. I'm sure he was still in love with her. Two other people were there. These people were also there the, the night of the murder later. A young lady named Abigail Folger. Everybody's heard of the Folger Coffee Empire. Good coffee. And she was the heir to that great uh, enterprise. And a man named Victor Fratowski. He was down on his luck, didn't have a job. He was Abigail's boyfriend. And Sharon Tate, being very generous, very kind, they just let them live there. They'd been there for months living because they didn't have anywhere else to live, apparently. That afternoon, when Manson got out of the car, Tex Watson driving, Manson went up to the, toward the front door, and there was a photographer, an Iranian gentleman named Shirak Hatami. And he was not at all pleased when he saw this this uh, vermin-like creature walking up toward the front door, Charles Manson. So he went out there to meet him because he was there to, to photograph Sharon Tate and he was very solicitous of Sharon. He was like a bodyguard for her. Now, young Sebring was inside the home as were Victor Fratowski and Abigail Folger. Now, <clears throat> Chirac comes out and says, what are you doing? What, who are you looking for? Who are you looking for like that? And Manson told him, Terry Melcher. And, for, and uh, 
The photographer said, he's back there. You're in the wrong place. He lives back behind here. You've got to go down that alley to go find Terry Melch. He lives in a, in a little apartment back there behind our place. So, this is very significant, knowing Charles Manson. Because now he had to walk through this little back alley where to Charles Manson would be the home of rats and cats and dogs and garbage cans. And Manson see, saw this as another example of how he had been mistreated all of his life by the establishment. <coughs> now, that day, March 23rd, some four and a half months before the night in the weekend of Helter Skelter, Charles Manson got back in the car after trying to uh, connect with Terry Melcher, which he didn't, and told Tex Watson this is going to be the first place for Helter Skelter. And Sharon Tate had come to the door and it asked Katami, the uh, Iranian photographer, who is this? And, and Hatami had said, he's not, he's in the wrong place. He, no, no problem. He's in the wrong place. Go on back inside, Sharon. So, now that was in March. Now we're moving up through the spring on into the summer. They have been at the ranch there about a year. They arrived at the ranch, the family arrived at the ranch in the summer of 68. Now we're in the summer of 69. Susan Atkins, Leslie Van Houten, Katie, Trisha Krenwinkel, they were still at the upper structure of the Manson family. Susan Atkins, almost every day of her life, would kiss Manson's feet. And in fact, uh, Manson one day told her, I want you to go to Rio de Janeiro and get me a coconut. I don't even know if I pronounced it right. Uh, my, my tongue tied. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> Susan Atkins, Atkins says, okay. She's going to go to Rio de Janeiro and get a coconut for him because the city wants a coconut. And then he says, oh, I'm just kidding, Sadie. Sit down. We're good. Now, in uh, the month of July, the month before Helter Skelter, Linda Kasabian, who would become an incredibly important figure in this story, moved there, 18 years old, 17, 18 years old, left her husband, brought her two children, and she became a very quickly a favorite of Manson's. She was one of the few that came there and before Manson could get to her, the first day Tex Watson had sex with her and Manson had to play second fiddle. That didn't please him too much. I'm surprised he didn't cut Watson's head off, but at any rate. Linda Kasabian would be very crucial to this story. Now, quickly, I had mentioned the two of the motives. That was a third motive. But it was so dang preposterous that I've always, in giving this lecture, said, do I mention it? Do I go into it? But I'm going to try to just quickly deal with it. Manson, sincerely, in his twisted mind, in his drug-ruined uh, mind, believed that he could start a race war by killing all these white people at Sharon Tate's house, and he had this elaborate plan. You wouldn't believe the steps. But eventually, the Black Panthers would kill all of the white people with the help of uh, the liberals, as Manson put it. Manson was quite uh, cynical. And he called the liberals, um, he, he called the conservatives uptight piggies. And then he called the liberals the, the hippies. And uh, he was convinced this race war was going to go on and, and then eventually all of the whites would be killed. Meanwhile, Manson would be with his family up under the ground in the desert where there was a city that he described knowing it was down there in the ground and it was right from the book of Revelation. 
where no sun and no moon, where there was a tree that had 12 uh, branches of different fruits, and I could go on and on. But Manson was convinced, oh, that while they were down there, the family would grow to 144,000. Kind of like the Jewish situation in the Bible. Now, that was so preposterous. But the first two motives are where we are. That's the main thing. So we move to, stay, bear with me now. We're getting close to the end here. And I want you to do what I used to tell jurors to do. And it was effective. As I tell you what happened from here on, I want you in the eyes of your mind to pretend you're watching a movie and you're watching this. Now you could protect, you could picture Charles Manson, the little five foot two inch pipsqueak. You could picture the three girls. Linda Kasabian being the fourth girl, Tex, Charles Tex Watson. Friday night, August the 8th, a few hours away from Helter Skelter. And Manson goes to Linda Kasabian, who's got no idea about Manson's lust for murder. She knew all about the creepy crawly missions, but only when they just went out to steal and vandalize. She didn't know about all the murdering. But Manson had thoroughly briefed Susan Atkins, Sadie, and Patricia Krenwinkel, Katie, and Tex Watson. Leslie Van Houten did not go this night. She went the next night to the La Biancas. Charles Manson did not go to the Tate residence. But his robots, as Bougalio, she kept calling them, were so trained, they were so uh, automated, and they had been so thoroughly prepared for the mission of murder that night. Manson goes to, uh, to Linda Kasabian and says, get your driver's license, get a change of clothes, get a knife, and meet me so-and-so. Linda Kasabian did that. When she got there, Manson was standing there. This was pushing on toward 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, Friday night. When she went, that was Tex Watson standing beside a car, and inside was Sadie, and Katie. Katie being Patricia Krenwinkel, Sadie being Susan Atkins. And Manson was over there giving last minute instructions to Tex Watson. Tex Watson knew exactly where they were going to go. Linda Kasabian being clueless just thinks they're going out to creepy crawly and feet and, and, and steal. So as they begin to drive out, Manson walks over and stops the car. And he looks at Patricia and Sadie, and he says, leave a sign. Something witchy. You girls know what I mean. And they started laughing uncontrolled because they were, they were crazy as bed bugs, so both Katie and Sadie. So they drove directly to the compound, which is a big, huge house, Sharon Tate, Polanski's house. The same three people that were in the house four months earlier were there that night. Sharon Tate was sitting on the bed with Jay Sebring, her ex-lover, but they were, Sharon Tate is 15 days away from giving birth to her first child. This is a big deal. In another part of the house was Victor Fertowski, Fertowski, excuse me, and Abigail Folger. Now, I want you to see this unfold. So they drive to the top of the hill where the gate was. Charles Tex Watson got out, climbed up a telephone pole, and cut the wires. And the wires fell to the ground. Linda Kasabian, who later was given immunity to testify and testified for 18 days, said she did not see the wires be cut, but she heard them fall to the ground when in doubt. Charles Tex Watson then gets back in the car and they go down and park the car at the bottom of the hill. 
Charles Tex Watson has a gun, a revolver, and there are three knives there. Katie's got one, Sadie's got one, Linda Kasabian's got a knife. Now on the way there that night, Watson had told Linda Kasabian to wrap the knife and the, uh, the three knives and the gun in, in her skirt, a change of clothing, and if they got stopped before they got there, to throw them out the window. But that didn't happen, so they got there. They began to walk up the hill. Now, <clears throat> here you got four complete loons, crazy as bed bugs. Their brains fried on drugs. Linda Kasabian is at a Sunday school picnic compared to the others. And they're going to this home. They climb over the wall. They start walking down toward the house. And a young man named Stephen Parent, who was there that night visiting his friend, who was the groundskeeper, who lived back in the back area there where Terry Melcher had lived in the past. Stephen Parent is driving out in his car. The lights go toward the robots, Manson's robots, as they walk. Now, <clears throat> Charles Tex Watson tells the girls to jump back, and then he jumps right up to the car. The guy stops, foolishly, and Watson just very simply reaches in and shoots him four times. And then pushes the car off to the side, and they go on down to the Tate residence. Now the four occupants inside the home are all awake. Sharon Tate, uh, even though she and uh, Knucklehead there, uh, Jay Sebring, they were not involved sexually anymore. She's sitting there with just a bra on, Sebring sitting there on the bed. But the other two were in another part of the house. Now Linda Kasabian is with them. Now all of this comes primarily from Linda Kasabian's 18 days on the stand. And I'm, Bugliosa in his closing argument said for 18 days, Linda Kasabian and Truth were companions. And she was, she was a companion to Truth. I told you she'd been given a complete <coughs> immunity. Now, Tex Watson, as they get to the big home, says, go around back, Linda, and see if there are any open doors, any open windows. She did. There weren't any. And she's getting real nervous at this point, Linda Kasabian. And so she says, no, they're not. Tex, meanwhile, is at the front cutting the screen to get in a window, it appeared. And he tells her, to go back down to the car and to wait, which she's glad to do. She goes back down to the car, and in a few minutes, Patricia Krenwinkel, Katie, comes running down there and says, give me the third knife. That was Kasabian's knife, because Sadie had a knife, Patricia had a knife, Tex had the gun, but he also needed a knife. But he also had a long stretch of rope. This will be significant. So when they get to the house, they get in. We don't know exactly how that happened. But they went in, and Sadie and Tex went to the bedroom where Sebring and Sharon Tate were. Tex announces, I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's work. And they just begin to start cutting right and left. They just begin cut and the screaming started Linda Kasabian down below says she cannot describe what it sounded like she said I've never heard anything like that I cannot describe how bad it was so she runs up the hill goes back over the fence goes to the compound to the house goes inside when she gets there Poor old Victor Fratowski was walking out of the door, 
He's as bloody as a stuck pig, blood everywhere. And she says to him, Linda Sabian, I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Meanwhile, Susan Atkins, a total fruitcake, she comes out and Linda Kasabian says, make it stop, Sadie. Make it stop. And she said, oh, it's too late. It's way too late for that. And Sadie mocks Victor Frakowski because he's begging for his life. Then Katie comes running after Abigail Folger. Abigail Folger is running for her life, screaming bloody murder. And, Ab and uh, Kate, Patricia Krenwinkle has got a knife chasing after her. Now, in a few minutes after that happened, after Linda Kasabian ran back down to the car, maybe five, ten more minutes, and the other three... Tex, Katie, Sadie, run down to the car, and they leave. Now, these, these demented people, uh, Katie is just complaining that her hand hurt so bad. She said, the bones kept getting in the way when I was stabbing the two women. The, their bones kept getting in the way and man my hand hurts and I should be being serious. Complete idiot. The bones the hurt. And then both girls, Sadie and Katie, are complaining about how their hair hurt because the victims were grabbing at the hair when they were being bludgeoned to death, I mean being stabbed to death. Now, they go back to the scene we go back to the farm, the ranch. Charles Manson, like a Viet Cong sniper, has not moved an inch. He's standing in the same place when they get back two hours later. And he greets them. How did it go? And they begin to tell him. And Manson says, oh, did you frighten all of these people? Did you make them afraid? I told you, I didn't want you to make them afraid. Just, you know, cut them a thousand times, but don't make them. And, and he, Manson said, oh, it was, sounds like it was too messy. And so I'm going to uh, go with you all tomorrow night to show you how to do it right. So <clears throat> nobody knows that these four people are dead. Abigail Folger's lying on the grass. Fratowski's lying on the grass out in front. The two are inside. Oh. As far as Jay Sebring and Sharon Tate are concerned, they both had a hangman's noose wrapped around their necks with the rope going up over a beam in the ceiling and then coming down on each side and so if one of them moved the other one have to get off the ground I mean it was they were hung both of them but that's not what killed them now Stephen's parents already been murdered he's been shot four times Sharon Tate was shot excuse me Sharon Tate was stabbed 16 times Five of them were so severe and so penetrating that any one of the five would have killed her. <clears throat> the stab wounds went into her bones. They went in through her chest, heart, liver. It was a horrible mess. The little child inside her womb was actually another victim that night because she was the child was 15 days away from birth. She died within minutes of Sharon Tate expiring. Jay Sebring, he got, a, got away pretty easy. He really did. He was only stabbed seven times. They were really merciful to him. Now, three of the stab wounds were so bad that he was bleeding like you can't imagine. But he was also shot for good measure. And that would have killed him too. Poor Abigail Folger wearing a cream colored dress that night. And of course the next morning everybody thought what a nice crimson dress she was wearing. 
because blood soaked like you wouldn't believe. Poor Abigail Folger was stabbed 28 times. And at least seven or eight of them would have killed her in and of themselves, any one of them. Poor Victor Fratowski, good gracious alive, was stabbed 51 times. He was pistol whipped by Tex Watson to the extent that there were 13 very serious head injuries to Victor Fratowski. The gun was shattered in, in the process of beating the hell out of him on the ground out front. And Linda Kasabian had seen that. As, as she's talking to Sadie on the front porch and as Katie's chasing Abigail Folger, she can see uh, Wet Watson stabbing and beating. Oh, and they shot him twice for good measure. Fortowski. Now, Sadie, Susan Atkins, in prison, waiting, awaiting trial, bragged about what all she had done. And that helped break the case. She bragged to a woman named Virginia Graham. And uh, Susan Atkins, Sadie, said, well, when we got there, I knew I was going to go after the woman, meaning Sharon Tate. And she said Sharon Tate was begging for her life. And Susan Atkins said, bitch, it doesn't matter to me. I'm going to enjoy this. You're going to be the last one to be killed. And I'm going to make you watch all the others be killed. And, and Sharon Tate was begging for the life of her baby. And she said, Sadie, that doesn't bother me a bit. Now Susan Atkins tells Virginia Graham that it was really soft how the knife went into the went into the body of Sharon Tate at first. It was just really thrilling how soft it was. This is Sadie now. But then of course we got down to where the bones were. And then I said I want to cut her fingers off. And I want to cut her eyeballs out and squish them against the wall. Now this is Sadie. Now, everything that Linda Kasabian had seen, which was only part of it, lined up with all of the physical evidence. Because the cream colored dress being worn by uh, Abigail Folger was as crimson colored as anything could be. Not like your shirt. Now, I need to wrap this up because just need to. They went back to the ranch, as I said, and Manson says that he was going to go the next night. Now, I'm going to give short shrift to it, but I want to tell you what happened to the LaBiancas the next night, 24 hours later. Sadie stayed in the car at the LaBianca La residence. So did Linda Kasabian. But Manson went in first at the LaBianca residence, the home of Leno and Rosemary, several miles away from the Tate compound. Now when Manson went in, it, we don't know exactly how this developed, but the wife was in a back room a good bit away and somehow Manson got in and was able to tie Leno up pretty, pretty soundly and, and uh, told him just, just be a good piggy now. You just be a good little piggy. Nobody will bother you. When nobody's going to hurt you. And then he went back and did the same thing with Rosemary, the wife. Tied her up with leather thongs. Now, then he goes out and he tells Katie and Van Houten and Tex, it's all yours. So they go in and commit the second night of Helter Skelter. Now we're about through, so hang with me. Those two were stabbed 69 times between them. 67 times, excuse me. Because of the 102 at the other scene. Rosemary was stabbed 41 times. And any number of them would have been uh, the death blow. Leno was only stabbed 26 times. He got out pretty easy. 
He was stabbed 12 times with a knife. And then there was a double tined fork, which would stab you twice if you plunged it one time. So he had 14 stab wounds with the double tined fork and 12 with the knife, 26. The knife was embedded in his throat and the fork was embedded in his abdomen. When the police got there the next night, it was all, they were there for 24 hours before they were found. When the police got there, that double tined fork was right in his abdomen. The word war was uh, written all over, it had been carved into his abdomen. The knife was in his throat, and there was a blood soaked pillowcase around his head with a lamp tied around the pillowcase, of course, unplugged. And that was exactly the same situation. The blood soaked pillowcase and lamp and everything back in the back room for, for Mrs. LaBianca. At this residence, the word rise had been written in La uh, Mr. LaBianca's blood. The word helter, skelter. They didn't have enough sense to spell helter right. They spelled it H-E-A-L-T-E-R. It was written in blood on the wall, and uh, Death to Pigs was written on the refrigerator. All of this in La Bianca, Mr. La Bianca's blood. The night before at the Tate residence, they had been just real efficient. They had just written the word pig uh, on the wall in Sharon Tate's blood. Now, there's, there's so much more that I'm not about to keep y'all to go into so much more. It's just not possible to do this in an hour. But throughout the trial, their conduct, what all they did, you cannot conceive of what a three-ring circus it was when they all got tried. They all were convicted Tex Watson had to be tried later for a number of reasons, dealing with extradition. But they all got the death penalty. But the California Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court declared the death penalty unconstitutional in 1972. And with one fell swoop of the Supreme Court's hand, about 400 people in America went from death row to life in prison including Manson, and including a bunch of other people that you would recognize. Now, there's so much more, but I'm going to stop. There are so many lessons here. Man's capacity for evil, the, the combination of hatred, and the combination of a warped mind, the combination of drugs, and the combination of demonic forces and everything you can think of came together here that weekend. It uh, will continue to resonate in our history. Uh, I didn't enjoy any of this blood stuff, talking about all the blood and the murder, but it just is necessary to explain just what a horrible capacity man has to hurt other people. We think about terrorism. Boy, this was domestic terrorism that night. I know. I remember where I was when I heard it on the radio. I right. I was going to work at a summer job. Right. After my senior year in high school. And, um, everybody in this country, it seems, was scared when they heard the news. Not just the people in California. Everybody. There was no one could believe that something like this had happened. It could have. Good point. And what's, and what's funny is that a few years, years before was the summer of love. It's when all you've heard the, uh, the saying love, peace, happiness, where everybody for the family of man. And it's interesting. It seems to me that this Manson family, everyone was communal. You know, everyone was for everyone else. It seems that this Manson family formed, uh, ironically, from the summer of love, from the things that were 
that went on in the Haight-Ashby area in the mid-60s. It was 64, 65 was the, the freedom. Right. Uh, Hate Ashbury, so everybody was, it was a uh, decade to forget, right? right. 